Well, hello, everybody. My name is Robert Douglas, and I am here with another episode of Deploy Friday because it's Friday and it's the best day to deploy your application. And as always, I'm joined by a number of amazing guests from the internet who do amazing things. And it's just going to be my honor, along with my colleague Otavio, to speak to these guests for the next hour, along with your questions about Quarkus. Now, I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves individually in a moment, but I will note that they are all from Red Hat, and two of you are from Raleigh area, as far as I know, and I was last in the Raleigh area specifically to see Michael Tiemann from Red Hat, so a colleague of yours, and Michael, if you're watching, call out to you. Um, hope you are. So anyway, let's do some introductions. Uh, Burr, why don't you start? Well, my name is Burr Sutter, and I'm the uh, Global Director of Developer Experience here at Red Hat. So basically, I manage the team of developer advocates that travel the globe and preach the gospel. No, that's not a way to say it. But we actually spend a lot of time talking to developers about what they need and, but what, and what they're interested in. And the good news about having that job is you get to play with all kinds of really cool, fun technologies. So we live in a world of Kubernetes and Quarkus and how to manage Java workloads properly on Kubernetes and Knative and Tecton and Istio and all kinds of fun stuff from that perspective. Well, so my head is already spinning from the alphabet soup. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Tons of fun. <laughs> Buzzword rich. Awesome. Thank you, Burr. Uh, Karina, where are you? Who are you? What do you do? Sure. Hey, everybody. I am Karina Varela. I am based in Brazil, also a red header. I work as a technical marketing manager in the application services BU, specifically with the business automation product. So we see how we can take business automation closer to the dev teams by working with business automation workflows, uh, automation, automating business de uh, decisions, and a little bit of a uh, couple of more stuff behind that, and integrating with all the cool stuff that we already said. So yeah, basically that's it. Oh, nice thank to you. meet you all. Yes, you too. Edson, who are you? Oh, hello everyone. I'm Ed Sionaga. I'm a Brazilian Japanese who happens to work with Burr on the same developer experience team. So um, I share some of the responsibilities. We travel worldwide. We try, to, we try to help developers to become even better. And I also happen to be, just like Burr and Otavio, a Java champion. And I'm also a Microsoft MVP. Wow, fantastic. And the topic of the day is Quarkus. Okay, that, now this is, I'm going to be frank, a project of, that I didn't hear about until my colleague Otavio introduced it to me. So Otavio, please introduce Quarkus a little bit to our audience, as well as yourself. And I will point out that in the comments or the description for this video, there is a link where you can try Quarkus as you're watching on Platform SH, and Otavio is the maintainer of the Quarkus template that runs on Platform SH, so you know all about it, sir. What is Quarkus? Okay, on my perspective, it's, it's amazing framework from Java that allows us to create a small application, medium application, and run it fast. That's amazing how we can run and test one application using Quarkus, at least on my perspective. Uh, on the platform stage perspective, that was really, really easier, easier to take the Quarkus application and move to the cloud with platform stage. That's why I wrote six, six articles that includes uh, Quarkus with JPA, with Panache, that's amazing active record that's make it really, really easier to write application that include JPA, that's mean relational database, and now so MongoDB. And so you can do a amazing application with Quarkus and it's really, really easier to make that happen. However, I have several trade-offs that are gonna convert to question to you guys. So kick it off, Otavia. What's your first question? Who's your first victim? <laughs> My and I have to say, I have to say that I've heard some of these questions before, and oh boy, I'm yeah, willing to see it. This will be a great discussion. Please go yep. on, Otavio. <laughs> uh, I have listened to, uh, from Emono Bernard, who is a friend of colleague of us, and he did an amazing presentation about Quarkus that I usually usually use as a base to me. And he mentioned about Panache, right? 
and he said that's amazing he posted however when you extend your entity object on the software object in definition there's no mapper anymore that's about reactive records my first question why not just say directly that's active records instead of oh, okay that's not active records likes look like and just that's my that. first one burr that looks like a question that you were just itching to take oh well I was, I, and actually i wanted to say something about you know kind of introducing quarkus and that would be great. a good idea because i think we really skipped that a little bit um yeah. so go ahead if we can back up just a little bit i mean where in the software world does this thing fit, okay, for the people who have never heard of it like me? Well, I'll tell you our motivations. So uh, just why Quarkus came about within Red Hat. And we, we have actually been living in this Kubernetes world for five solid years now. We were the first uh, organization to bring Kubernetes to the modern enterprise. And what we found over that five-year journey with customers as they build out their next cloud and native microservice kind of application architecture we had a lot of people who started with Java because that's the world we came from. I came from the JBoss acquisition 14 years ago. So we had tons of Java early on, but over time we kept hearing from customers, well, I'm, I'm gonna just start rewrite that component in Node.js. I'm gonna rewrite that component in Go. And we, would, we drilled down on that. And we're like, why not stick with Java? They're like, too fat, too slow. And we were hearing that as a reoccurring theme. That bell was being run, rung every week at, at some point. Java is too fat and slow for a microservice architecture. Java is too fat and slow for cloud native architecture. We, and so we had to, we want to step back and think about that. As we mentioned, there's a lot of Java champions in this call. That's true of Red Hat. We have, I don't know, probably 45 Java champions within Red Hat, including Emmanuel Bernard and other key people. So they want to go back to the drawing board and said, can we rethink how Java behaves, right? So that it actually is fast and small. And another key element that we want to do for Java was we want to make that developer joy come back. You know, if you remember that first time you built your very first Java application, it was fun, it was neat, it was awesome. And over time, because of, let's call it, you know, the heaviness of some of the J2E and things of that, it, it got clunky, it got hard. You know, we ended up building jars and wars and ears and have 30 minute build cycles that took a massive CI CD pipeline to even get the damn thing running. Well, could we go back to you hack it, you save it, you code it, edit, save, refresh, edit, save, refresh. And that was another key. For the record, that's why I switched from Java to PHP back in 2004. 30-minute build time for the application that I was working on. Right. And, and one of the key reasons people were flipping to Node.js, because when I drilled down on the Node.js thing, they're like, well, let me show you what Node does. So now Quarkus does that same thing. So when I go talk to those Node people, I'm like, we got the same thing now, watch. And so that was a big thing. Uh, and Edson, I'd like you to actually kind of comment on that because I said some things that I know you're interested in, but also I know you're very interested in that Panache question that Octavio uh, threw out there. Hey, well, thank you for the Quarkus explanation. And Octavio, now that you mentioned Panache, uh, for, you, for those of you that are not familiar with Panache, with Panache, Quarkus tried to provide uh, an alternative API for persistence. And why don't we call it active record? Well, usually I try to mention active record by pairing. Traditionally in the software development world, we had two different persistent styles. We had um, uh, repositories, which is the one Java developers are used to because it was super hard or almost impractical to do that in the past in the Java language. So that's why we stick to repositories. We have a interface, we have a class and implementation. And with traditional active record, the one that uh, came from uh, Ruby and Rails, for example, uh, your entity blends the persistent methods inside the same class, the same code. I think the Quarkus team took a special care to not mention directly active record because we have different expectations. When you have a traditional active record class from Ruby and Rails, you have insert methods, you have update methods, you have delete methods which meant directly to a um, traditional SQL mapper. For example, if you ever use an IBETIS, you just map the SQL statements that you want to execute on the database. On the other hand, an ASH entity, when you're using the active record style, in fact, you're using a JPA entity manager behind. So you have a, um, an entity manager, you're not directly mapping the SQL statements to, so when you execute, you don't have an insert method, you have a persist, you don't have an update method. You have a merge because you're adding the exactly same behavior that you have on Entity Manager. And we thought that, well, maybe we've ever heard about the active records, it could confuse the people. 
And this is not the official explanation, but that's my reasoning behind why didn't we call that, that, that directly, even though I mentioned frequently in my talks that yes, it's kind of an active record style, but if you ever use Ruby and Rails, it's not the same thing because we're using managed objects and not just a plain log SQL mapper. And I have to say that's really interesting because I was a Ruby on Rails programmer. And when I first saw Panashi, I linked it to Active Directory, Active Directory style. And yeah, it's good to learn that. <laughs> but I'm not a Ruby on Rails developer. Is this what I would equate in my mind to like Spring Data? No, Spring Data uses the repository pattern, which by the way, Panache supports too. So uh, you don't have to choose active record style. You can use repositories just like Spring Data. Uh, the benefit of using active record style, just like Ruby on Rails, is that you create a new person. You don't have to inject a repository instance and call repository.save or repository.insert your person. If you have the person object that you just created, you just type person.insert and it's inserted in the database. So for simple applications, your code becomes much simpler. Even though that's another discussion, I wouldn't recommend this particular style for complex uh, business domain models. Uh, for simpler domain models, I think uh, the high productivity uh, is worth compared to uh, other alternatives. Cool, yeah. thanks. I, I hadn't understood that distinction at all, but uh, that explains it for me nicely. Um, <clears throat> we've got a number of people in the audience who are checking into the YouTube chat saying hello or hola. And I just wanted to say hello back. And also, this is where you can ask your questions to any of the panelists. So don't be shy. Uh, the questions, um, we can get to those, uh, yeah, uh, in the course of the conversation. So ask them right up, right up front. Cool. Um, Ed, so, okay. so I have one more, more question about that because my feeling when you talk about complexity was what I have in my mind because basically you need to, we are not able to put private in some fields, right? Uh, like injection, something like that. And as a Java developer, I read several books that mention to always use the less visibility as possible, such as Effective Java, that's mentioned in the 13th item. So use privacy as soon as you can. We have the clean code that say in this chapter, I guess chapter seven, let's say the main difference between structure and OOP is because OOP hide the data to expose the behavior. We have clean architecture, we have DDD, we have also DSL builder. We have several design architecture and design of code who mentioned something about put everything private as possible. However, I'm not able to do that in Quarkus. And what do you recommend to you? I mean, should I use Quarkus to something that has a huge complexity? Oh no, just use an, an anemic, anemic model to this kind of thing. I mean, if I use Quarkus, should I avoid rich model, something like that you usually read a lot about it? Okay, I uh, two different points. Uh, I don't know if you're talking about you about public or private fields in Panache entities or general fields, injected in, fields in general uh, fields. Because even CDI, I'm not able to like define an interface, a public interface, in several implementation hides like package default, something like that. Okay. So, uh, so suppose you have a bean, you have a single tour or application scoped bean, and then you want to inject a few directly. And, and usually saying you can't be private. Actually, you can. We just recommend you to make it package private because it allows Quarkus to perform even more optimizations. So your code will be smaller and faster. I don't know how much, but you can use private. We just recommend you to use that. On the other hand, it's not uncommon for you when you're designing code that needs to be injected. Injected, So you could, for example, provide the setter 
for that particular property. So it could be injected and uh, you could inject a mock about that. So, but it's not unusual too. You always develop the test, test case using the same package of your original bean definition. So it's not uncommon for you to use a package private definition so you can inject the fields directly. And third point, you don't have to use field injection. You could be using constructor injections, which these days I think it's most people would agree that it's another better alternative for you to be injecting the fields. And if you complain that your constructor has too many parameters, then it's another symptom. Maybe you're doing too much on your class. So, you know, Otavio, uh, you know me for a long time. You know I love and I advocate for these best presses for software development. But I, I, I don't see a conflict between what Quarkus proposes and all the best practices that we've been doing in the past uh, 20 years. I think they're still compatible because it's possible to uh, do both. Oh, nice. There, there's one thing uh, I, I would like to throw in and inject into the conversation. Uh, and it occurs to me because we talked, we said PHP, we said Ruby on Rails, we basically, and I said there was this Node.js movement, right, within our user base, our customer base. There, if we think, if we take a step back uh, uh, for away from being hardcore Java people and think more about just getting that business app out the door. And in a microservices world, right, you actually do not optimize for use, you optimize for replaceability, right? And microservices should be completely replaceable in three weeks or one sprint or two sprints, things like that. If you think of that model, you should not want to over-optimize up front in some cases. In other words, your prototype goes to production in many cases. That was the beauty of Ruby on Rails. That was the beauty of PHP, the beauty of Node.js, Python, Flask, all those other environments, the prototype goes to production. I'm not saying I always agree with that, right? In many cases, that's a bad idea. But for a lot of use cases, especially in this new cloud native microservice, we got to deploy quickly. It might be the best answer. So Quarkus did enable some of those things. That's what really what Pat Nash represents to me is a different mindset. So yes, we can go down the hardcore best practices of engineering and we should at times and we can. However, in a lot of cases, you need to get that microservice shipped and let's optimize for that and meeting the business need faster. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. And I would like to add that with Quarkus, you don't have to commit to one alternative or one approach or the other one. You can do the stuff that works very quickly because it's super productive, but Quarkus is still old traditional Java. If you want to do it the proper way, like for you to maintain this code for the next 25 years, you can too. And you have, don't have to do everything at the same time. Oh, that's good to know. Thank you for that answer. I just figure out why why not put that information in the documentation. But anyway, uh, thank you for explanation. And I have a good question because if you are a Twitter user, you saw a lot of the, a lot of people try to compare Quarkus and Micronotes. Could you guys tell me the difference between these guys and the similarity? Why micro notes, N-O-T-E-S, micro nodes. I, another term I've never heard. Micronaut, like astronaut. Micronaut. Uh, ah. Okay, thank you. Karina, you haven't spoken in a while. You want to dive in on that one? No, that's okay. You can go with that one. I'm actually, every time I want to interrupt because I'm usually uh, guiding the panels, so I'm trying to control myself. You can go on. That's okay. <laughs> No, no, feel free. You got the Kajito tag on your on your uh, shoulder. Yeah, I'll bring right? that later. I'll yeah, bring okay. that up later. We'll get, we'll get to that one. That's another awesome thing. But Thank on the you. Micronaut on the Micronaut story, uh, I actually personally have never put hands on Micronaut, so I really not should be the judge of Micronaut. So I think the Micronauts say, are probably thankful for that. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, it comes from Marvel Comics. So how they got away with the copyright violation, I I really love to know. Uh, but in case. Um, in the case of Micronaut, which is a technology which actually came from Graham Roche, who originally splint, uh, they broke off from the Pivotal team, right? It came from that Grails uh, mindset. They actually do have a lot of same mindset, right? You know, we want to make you productive. We want to make you focus. We want to make it small and uh, small and fast. They also will leverage uh, Grail VM, right? If you guys haven't heard of that, right? Grail VM is uh, an element that you would use to compile to a native code. Uh, so Quarkus offers both pure JVM mode, which is actually 
one, probably the most popular at this moment, and Grail VM native image, right, which you can compile it down to native executable, like on Mac or Linux and Windows is coming. So Micronaut shares a lot of the same set of principles. So they are very much like a Quarkus. Uh, the one thing distinction I would say is Quark, another place Quarkus came from, it originally came from a guy named Sonne, uh, who you might know as the Hibernate lead. If you're familiar with the uh, Hibernate project, we were also getting a ton of feedback from customers, and you may have personally experienced this. Someone in this stream right now, or you on the, the panel, people were telling us Hibernate was too fat and slow. It's too big. It is a ginormous beast to be applied to my use case. We were hearing that pretty often. And what's-, what's I thought that back in 2000. <laughs> well, what, well, what's funny, and if you listen to Sonny's presentation on why we even got started on this adventure, he was thinking about that same issue. And, and I'll just give you one little bit of context that Sonny likes to talk about. And that is, if you have Hibernate ORM and you drop it into your application, inside that payload is, it's ready for Oracle, ready for SQL Server, ready for DB2, ready for Postgres, ready for MySQL, ready for this, that, and the other. And guess what? Your app probably only talks to one of those databases. So basically it will do the real uh, ahead of time build time optimization to remove all references to Oracle of which there are over 300, right? In Hibernate before it goes out the door because you're only using Postgres or vice versa, right? So that, that concept was really an eye opener for me when Sonny walked me through that principle and how we got started on this journey. So if you think about it from just that core principle, we started with Hibernate, optimizing Hibernate, which is maybe one of the hardest projects in open source land to have solved this problem for. And so that's the place place we came from. Edson, Micronaut? Uh, yes, well, I'm very thankful for Micronaut, just as I'm thankful for Quarkus. I think both represent um, a new era for Java, because Quarkus and Micronaut, they're the fir very first two frameworks of, within the Java uh, space that are optimized for build time. So instead of the traditional Java way, do everything when your process is starting. Micronaut and Quarkus provides the way that, well, we do all of the have lifting at build time. So when your application starts, it's super lean and super fast. And so we both appear at the same time. Actually, Quarkus internally is older than uh, Micronaut, but I think we both target the same approach. It's completely subjective. It's just my personal opinion because I don't want to enter a flame war, <laughs> but I think that the Quarkus approach is much more powerful. Well, and, I, and I love the point Edson just made because it just occurred to me one time when I'm explaining Quarkus to some people, think, think of old school Java, right? If, if For the last 20 plus years with J2EE and then eventually Java EE, we, we always assumed when the JVM booted up that it could dig around on the file system find all those jars out there in the class path, read, serialize those you know, files into memory, scan them for their annotations, build a meta model out of all those annotations, and then run your first app, right? Run your request. So that takes a ton of time and CPU power to get all that going. And that, that's the WebSphere, WebLogic Spring, right? That's the JBoss, that's the old school way of thinking. And uh, so I love that legacy way of thinking because it got us to where we are today. But Quarkus and Micronaut came with a whole different mindset. It's like, why do we have to do all that at runtime? Why can't we just do all that file scanning, annotation scanning, meta model creation, all that jazz at build time? And it's a game changer when it comes to the performance of, of your application. How does that, that influence the developer sorry. experience? Sorry, Karina, I'm gonna let you go because, go ahead. Yeah, no, yeah, it's because uh, one of the things I would leverage when considering, for example, a Quarkus application and a Micronaut application is all the team that we have be behind Quarkus that is providing all the documentation to make it easy to start, to make it easy to use all the extensions. And the Red Hat team is also behind all the other products being Quarkified. So you have tons of extensions in there to be used along with your Quarkus application and take benefit of all the benefits that, uh, and take benefits of all the, the goodness that comes with Quarkus. So I think that's also something to be leveraged. Cool, thank you. Um, the question that I was going to ask is, how does um, this build time optimization versus startup time optimization, um, how does that affect the developer experience? It's, and I know this, well, you like this oh, one a lot. <laughs> uh, and you might be wondering why we didn't do this before. Why has Java been doing the exactly same thing, startup optimization in the past five years? 
I'd like to point out that compiler technology evolved a lot in the past five, 10 years. Disks are much faster, CPU power is much more available. So if we had to choose between build time and startup optimization, but if our build process would take like 10 times more, people probably wouldn't use it. But right now it is so fast that when you're using Quarkus Live Reloading, for example, live coding feature, you don't even notice that these optimizations are happening because it just happens in a matter of milliseconds. So that's where I can and type a change, say change green to blue and push save and then test it in my browser. Exactly. And if you ever tried Node.js, I've been, well, I spent the last two weeks doing a lot of uh, HTML and Node.js development. And I can assure you that Quarkus reloads faster than my Node.js application. Yeah, okay. that's the crazy what? thing. Exactly. Octavia, tweet that. That's That's got to go out there. The world needs we're, to know. We're faster and smaller than Node.js. And I show that in a lot of my presentations. Well, that was ex literally one of my questions. L let me look over to my questions. I was going to say, Burr, you give a lot of code demos. When you demo Quarkus, what is the moment where you blow developers' minds? Yeah, in many cases, it, there's two moments, which is the funny part. It's the edit, save, refresh, and you didn't wait. Like I hit, I was typing some code, I hit save, and I hit refresh. And and it, Ed's is even faster on the draw than I am. His his fingers are more nimble than mine. But you know, you don't wait. You see you see the result, and you're like, holy crap! Because in the Java world, that's game changing, and it is actually faster than even the Node.js engine if you've worked with Node.js for a while. Uh, there's another moment that's related to that one. It's not even the other moment I was talking about. And that is if you make an error, like let's say you forget the semicolon and you hit edit, save, refresh, you see the error right in the browser immediately. You know exactly what the issue is. You go add the semicolon, edit, save, refresh, boom, you're back to good again, like that Node.js experience is. And those, that's a game changing thing from a Java perspective, right? We didn't wait, have wait, that. Wait, 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 I have to ask about that. When you say see the error in the browser, do you mean the 500 kilobyte stack trace that I was used to seeing anytime I had a Java error? Well, you, we elevate the real issue up to the top and you still get that crazy ass stack trace at the bottom. <laughs> okay, good. Don't take my crazy ass stack trace away from me. You hear me, Quarkus? Right, exactly. It's still there. Uh, and then, the, so that's definitely an, uh, a moment of, wow, that's game changing. And then the other moment is if you do do the compile down to native, and we show that in many cases, and then you start that native, well, for one thing, the JVM based version starts in 0 0.02 seconds or something like that. But the, the, the native one will start in 0 0.002 seconds. And then you're like, and then in my case, I like to show that versus Node.js. And you literally see it's a faster startup and a smaller memory footprint than the same app in Node.js the same business logic. So it, that really are the moments where people go, okay, game changing from a Java community perspective. And even if you'd gone to the Node.js side, you might consider coming back now, right? So We've Karina, that when, when you talk to people about Quarkus, are these the, are these the points that you focus on when as a, as a product marketer? Definitely, I, I, I make sure I demo that every time, right? Those key points, because if you, when you see it, you know, you can't help but go, huh, there's something very interesting here. And how about you, Karina, as a product marketer? Is it is that the same messaging for you or is the developer story different than the business story? Yes, yeah, so we kind of have the both, but they are connected because from our perspective, especially with, within our team and uh, with the Cogito, the Cogito pro project that's coming and yeah, Cogito. So basically this is one of Quark's extensions, which allows, for example, blowing the mind of people who works with BPMN or DMN files who need to work with thousands of business rules deployed, like think of an airline company, for example. So they have like traffic uh, airline management, you know? Uh, we have a customer who is actually using one of our products in production. And they said, okay, let me try Quarkus and Cogito and see how that goes. Let me move from the traditional environment to Quarkus with Cogito. So I wanna use what, what, uh, the things that I already use, but Quarkified. And uh, by doing that, they could reach all these uh, benefits that Burr already mentioned, but they were doing drills rules. So this is one way of using an engine that is perform more performant for um, for business rules. 
So the thing here is to uh, the, one of the key points to notice is that they tested both native native compilation and the JIT mode. So they said, okay, so now that I have all my real use case on Cogito and Quarkus, let me see how this compares. Like, should I go native or not? And this is one of the stuff that we didn't talk yet in this panel. So should I go native or not? And this uh, that I'm talking about, we have all the graphics, all the in, uh, talk at Red Hat Summit that shows everything as plain. So they tried this and they saw that in a long term, the native execution was getting a little bit slower than when compiled with JIT. So this is one of the trade-offs that people need to think when defining, okay, should I go native or not? Uh, this is just uh, uh, dropping the seed for the next discussion, but going back to the product management. So yeah, uh, one of the big things we need to do is help Red Hat guiding the product in a way that it meets not only developers' needs, so all these questions that Otavio made, made here is like, we need to address those, but we also need to think about the things that Burr is saying, like we need to develop quick. How are we going to put this into like, how can we structure our teams and develop culture that supports the implementation of this technology which we're saying? So should I use Kubernetes? Should I not use? Uh, what do I need to do with all that? How can I connect that together? So the, the, like one of the roles uh, that I need to do is get all this information and needs from the developers, bring into Red Hat and make sure that our products are linked to that. So well, yeah. Let me ask you a specific question about that because one of the benefits touted is lower uh, memory footprint uh, and, and, and just smaller resources altogether, which of course, if you're running at scale and you need to you know, launch a thousand containers, that should have a cost impact. So do you try to talk to customers on the cost vector, like save resources while running in production? Yeah, so that's actually, it depends on each customer. So there are customers who would fit like a SaaS model better. Others would just prefer to run it on its uh, path in their own environment. So depending on the cost, they are willing to, the, the architecture model, model, they are willing to use they might have cost uh, differentiation cost in between that. So that's one of the things they need to consider before. But when going Quarkus, that's already implicit. They will have cost reduction. Like that's it. You don't, that's not a, a, a question mark, you know? So that's an implicit discussion. And I don't see why not migrating uh, the, micro the microservices to this uh, new project that is coming up, especially because it's based on micro profile. And Otavio will start smiling because he has a question to Yonaga on that and I know it. Otavio's but always smiling. Is, yeah. <laughs> so since Quarkus is based on micro profile, it makes it easy for developers, for Java developers who are already there to come into Quarkus. Also, it has like extensions for Spring. So Spring developers can feel comfortable on Quarkus. So and you don't have to still, decide Quarkus or Spring. Like because you don't have no, you don't have to decide it, especially because even when you use Spring extensions on Quarkus, we are still smaller than running the same thing on Spring Boot. So yeah, and that's, that's tested. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, anyway. but I, I still have to ask you. You no, mentioned I talk too much. <laughs> you, meant, you mentioned this guy who's on your shoulder, Koji Ko, Kojito. I can Kojito. barely read that. Yeah. Kojito. 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 Who's that and what is it? I mean, you said that somebody's taking it into production. So now I need to know. So yeah, this is one of uh, one of the projects that our team is taking further, and the intention is to make business automation cloud native, like mm -hmm. make it suitable for a cloud native environment. So what is business automation basically? Is getting people, uh, business people, allowed to help on development development without having that middle wall? Because we have DevOps that breaks the wall of confusion in between Dev and Ops. When we talk about getting bees together, we are breaking a wall of conf confusion in between bees and DevOps. So we are breaking this wall of confusion here that makes like those big, that those huge documentation files, which we need to spend times and times reading it and converting it to executable models that can be read by business people, changed by business people and deployed by developers. 
So you've got a product there that kind of short circuits the need for people to put um, screenshots into spreadsheets. No, 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 Robert, let me, let me give it, maybe add a little context here because this is another Thank historical. You, well, it's another historical thing that since I, I was watching the birthing of this and when we actually announced Quarkus to the world on Reddit, you know, Reddit can be kind of its own firestorm, if you will. One guy went off on it. Why the hell would you guys do anything for Java? Why did you? Why didn't you do this for Go or you know, you know, for Node? Right? It would have been awesome if you did all this amazing things for Node. Why did you bother doing it for Java? And he was really adamant that we we wasted our time trying to optimize anything for the Java community. And as you mentioned, Robert, you know, you once went to PHP for a while, or, or Karina mentioned she was in Ruby on Rails for a while. So one of the things that was really key and it's very important to this Kajito discussion is the Java ecosystem has this amazing set of all this awesome stuff. So in the case of Kajito, it, it comes from JBPM and Drools originally. And so Drools was an amazing rules engine so that if you did have a thousand business rules, you could have coded those in Java, if then else, if then else, if then else, or you can make them <laughs> declarative. Picture that, picture that, like 3,000, no, 30,000 business rules in if it's then else. And that's a real use case, like 3,000, 30,000 business rules. It's definitely right. case anyway. for switch in that case. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but but it, but in the case of the rules engine, it's optimized for branching, right? So it's it's you know literally if you have to take different routes to the uh, the Reedy algorithm, things like that. So the rules engine was incredibly powerful. And then there and then on the business process side, what if you are a mortgage processor that has to run a business process for days, if not weeks? You know, so you have to write the database structure yourself. You can read and write to the database, but that's a ton of code you have to write for dealing with long running business processes that have to be triggered based on certain external events. Like the user approves the mortgage or doesn't, you know, there's an error has to go back to the user and they got to fill it out again. So if you think of those two libraries, they were out there in the Java ecosystem and they weren't in the PHP ecosystem. You know what I mean? They weren't in the Node.js ecosystem, but they were amazing engines that actually solve real business problems for people. So why couldn't we do this on Java optimized that you set of use cases for Java? So I think that's a good little bit of backstory there that helps you understand why we did what we did in this case for Kajito. That is true. And just to, to clarify the screenshot part before we go back to, to Quarkus, it's not a screenshot, but it's actually a screenshot, but it's actually a graphical UI. So mm -hmm. you have like, I don't know, an Excel table or a web table where you can just type in values and that will be converted to code. Or you so can drag and drop. Kajito has like a native web UI, you're saying? Yes. Yes, oh, like okay. so it can be installed on VS Code or run on the web or run on on your desktop. So that's available. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what it is. One of the ways to bring Quark to give more power to Quarkus and to developers and business people. So go let's nice. go back to Quarkus. Thank you, <laughs> Octavio. Uh, I have one, one question to you guys about microprofile. On yeah, that's, that, that's a good one, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a good one because I saw in the blog post, right now we are compatible with MicroProfile 3.2, right? Uh, I think so, 2.3 maybe right now, I'm not sure. But anyway, as minimum requirement of the Eclipse MicroProfile, it has CDI. And to define CDI, what technology, technology who supports CDI? It needs to run a TCK and run the whole test as green, right? However, as far as I know, you're still not able to run um, the whole TCK and Quarkus. So if you're not able to run the CDI, does it does make sense to say that Quarkus is microprofile compatible if it is not following the minimal requirement? Edson, is that a question okay. for you? And if you take it, can you break down some of the acronyms that Otavio threw around so brutally, CDI, et cetera? OK, microprofile is a set of specifications. Uh, actually, it's also a working group, an organization that is trying to define new standards to enable cloud native applications. And within the set of specifications being developed under the microprofile umbrella, uh, you uh, have new ones and you're reusing old ones from Java E and Jakarta E, such as CDI, which is context and dependency injection specification. 
but nobody says that, everybody says just CDI. Uh, means that when you want to inject a field into a bin, you are using CDI, basically, and you want to have a managed environment. That's what CDI is for. And uh, the other word is TCK, uh, technology compatibility, compatibility kit. kit. Yeah. OK. Uh, you see, nobody mentioned that. We just say TCK, but that's what it means, which tests if a particular implementation of a specification is certified or it passes the TCK. So you have a lot of test cases which you run against your specification. And if they pass, you are certified. When I think what Otavio is complaining about Quarkus and Microprofile, and I can understand uh, some confusion about that. First is a matter of wording. Uh, Quarkus is not CDI certified. I don't know if we aim to, but the fact that we're not CDI certified, we never passed the TCK, we never ran the TCK probably, but we are compatible. What does compatibility mean? It means that you can reuse your knowledge from the CD, from the microprofile specifications, CDI specification included into Quarkus. And to prove our point, certification is important for uh, business. Certification is important if I'm developing an application server and I want to provide to customers. On the other hand, which one is the web container, uh, the most popular web container ever in the Java platform? Tomcat. Tomcat never ran the TCK, never claimed to be compatible. And actually, there might, there might be some corner cases in which you uh, don't follow the specification very well. You follow this, you have to do that. There could be. Uh, so and in case of um, Quarkus and CDI, we're not saying when we say we're compatible, and, th and that's my particular opinion, that's not an official statement. You can reuse the skills that you have on CDI, it will run exactly as you expect. But there are some features that we do not support. It's not that we're implementing that in a different way. Actually, I think it's stated what we do not support. Okay, so I think it's also a matter of wording. And Again, it's very important to have the standards. I don't want one method to behave one way and behave the other in the different on implementation. Specifications and standards allow, allow Java to become what it is today. So you could share the knowledge of this, those, specification, those specifications. So you have a lot of developers worldwide. They are used to the same annotations, are used to the same method signatures. Uh, I think that's the greatest benefits of all, but again, uh, not being certified never prevented anybody from adopting Tomcat into production, right? That's why everybody uses that. Yeah, so I would like to jump in on that a little bit for uh, Atevio's sake also, just to kind of make it a little more, again, a philosophical statement. When we invented Quarkus, we knew out of the gate what we had to compete with. Node.js, Go, right? PHP, uh, Ruby on Rails. We knew we were in a competitive environment. And we wanted to first create developer joy, right? So we will come back to that again and again and again. And developer joy extends from being able to do what they want to do when they put their fingers on the keyboard. So that's why there's a spring compatibility layer. If you already have the muscle memory for at rest controller, it's there. You just type at rest controller and you get it, right? The same thing is true of CDI, JPA, and all these other things. But you also see us innovate well beyond anybody else's innovations like Panache. Right? So we want to make sure we're an innovation focused effort more than anything else to create developer joy. And we will, therefore, that is our focus. That is our mission, not to be a slave to any previous requirement from a previous generation. We're living in this new cloud native world. So does that help give a little perspective? I love it. Also, I think that we have the CDI light being studied. Maybe that would help also on that perspective. Are you aware of that, Yanaga? Uh, yes, uh, I think it's another common question around CDI Lite. Why do we have CDI Lite or anything else? I think uh, we're proposing uh, CDI Lite to be a, a specification, for example. Mm -hmm. I think a standard is a, a term that like, is too strong. We're proposing that to be a specification. And some people might misinterpret this as, oh, we're just proposing CDI Lite because that's something that Parkers would uh, be able to support in full. Uh, from my understanding, the discussions regarding CDI Lite are, uh, came much before 
uh, quark is appearing. We just happen it's a bad timing for us mm -hmm. to do that because um, some of the stuff from the CDI is it's very rare for people to be using. To be honest, the very few times I've looked at the things that Quarkus doesn't support, I've never used it in my past 20 years. Well, CDI is not that old, but uh, some features I never use it for, from, from CDI. So I know there is a lot of rumors, a lot of discussions, and I'm saying that as an enterprise Java developer that has 25 years using Java, the things people are complaining are the stuff I never used. And uh, uh, it's not bragging. I'd like to think that I, I am an adv fairly advanced and experienced uh, enterprise developer. Fairly, uh, right? Fairly. Again, it's just, like... <laughs> I'm just being picky on, on, the, on the discussions that are, that are happening right now. Cool. Thank you. Um, I think we should move to some questions from the audience. And Wesley, my apologies. I'm going to skip your question and save it maybe for the end, because we did talk about the difference between Micronaut and Quarkus a little bit, although they probably could go deeper into that. Let's go to um, G. Dugonski's question. What kind of advice or pitfalls are known migrating legacy Java web applications from Java 6 or 8 to Quarkus? Uh, depends on which technologies or features do you use. Uh, I think if you're using the Java E web stack, like if you're stuck to Java 6, for example, it's very likely that you're still using like a Java E5 uh, or Java E6 uh, application. If you're using the Java e standards, if you're using EJB, sorry, you're out of luck. Especially if you're running stateful EJBs, then I'm really sorry for you. But um, if you're not, you probably could translate most of the code from EJBs to just like uh, CDI beans uh, and port that. But I have to mention again, for most enterprise of applications, if you think that the, uh, the JOXRS endpoint, the JPA code is the largest part of your code base, then you might be mistaken because your business application logic is probably the largest part of your code base. And I don't see any restrictions on why you wouldn't you be able to, to copy paste their code. There is no migration to right now. Oh, I just convert my projects. But again, business logic should be working properly because all the fundamentals from the Java E from the past 10 years, 15 years, uh, they are still there if you exclude EJB, for example. Well, I think JSF doesn't work as well. I think JSF is, and EJB are the two problematic areas. I think JSF works on JVM mode. If you want to try native mode, that's another question. Exactly. But that's what I was going to put in the into discussion because actually this is not my, how to migrate legacy Java web app to, Java, to Quarkus. It's how to migrate your legacy Java to microprofile. And are you wanting to run it to run on native or not? Because that's another set of things that you need to analyze. So there are two different aspects on this migration. And one, one thing I'll throw into discussion is phil it's a philosophical thing again. When we invented Quarkus, we invented it for that cloud native, Kubernetes native, greenfield application development. That's why we focus so much on that edit, save, refresh, right? You're writing new code. We didn't build it for a migration, you know, copy and paste old junk into the new world. Uh, we do think of people as, you know, rethinking the original architecture uh, and that old legacy technology that they might have had with EJB2 or old school JSF or something, you know, something old school, uh, you know, old school struts two, right? Maybe some of these things will work and can copy and paste forward, but that was not our focus. Our focus was on let's build that next gen JAXRS, you know, style REST controller that's going to give you that new API architecture that you then put a front end on. Right, like a nice Angular or Vue or React front end on that. You know, it was that new perspective. Great, thank you. Um, so, some Wesley is asking, can you guys provide some metrics from projects that are running on production that prove how optimized Quarkus is in regarding memory and boot time? Show me the money yeah, or the gotta, numbers. We got to pull those out of the blogs. So, if you want to have the blog handles uh, ready, right? We have tons of these. Okay, we can. I would we can... recommend go to the Quarkus blog because we have a lot of uh, customer references that uh, pe from people that are using Quarkus in production. I think from Vodafone in Europe, 
they were able to reduce like 50% of their cloud computing costs because Quarkus is 50% smaller when running on JVM mode, and it means a lot of money per month. I think Lufthansa Technique also has another uh, uh, report on how they were able to optimize their infrastructure using Quarkus. But I can't pull out all of the references from memory, but the blog has a lot of this, those references. So if you go to quarkus.io slash blog, I guess that's a URL, we were able to see a lot of people using that in production and what are the benefits from, for example, from resource and consumption and uh, cloud computing costs. Nice. Okay. It's also important to mention that Sorry. that's not on there. Those listed there are not all of it because there are some customers who doesn't like to go public, who don't like to go public. So you should have in mind that there that list is not like all the customers, are some of the customers running in production. Please go on, Otavio. Uh, ones on the blog are the ones that the lawyers authorized them to write. So this is yeah. a big <laughs> Lawyer approved. You know, and I just I just pulled it up real fast and just jumped on the first one. And it basically says, you know, in their big insurance application, it took 30 seconds to uh, restart the Spring Boot version of it. It takes two to three seconds to restart the Quarkus version of it. So less than 10% of the original startup time. Good. We got another question from Andre uh, Gambaro. There are good characteristics in Quarkus to sustain it, but what are the current efforts to make Quarkus a long-term solution and well-adopted? It sounds like the question is, how do I know if I go down this route that it's not like just a flash in the pan or a short-term phase or fad? Like a new Node.js, right? <laughs> I'll give you one critical, critical bit of uh, evidence as to that. For one, Red Hat as an organization, you know, a, you know, a very large organization, has already declared that we support this. In other words, we stand behind it. And that means there's an SLA now associated with that. So therefore, once it flips over into that, where there's a contractual SLA associated with it, which it has now, that means it's there, right? And, and when I say it's there, we tend not to give up on things for more, less than 15 years. And I can say that as someone who's been here for 14 <laughs> and as a, for that SLA, what kind of product do I need to purchase to get an SLA on my Quarkus? It's part of what we call our runtimes. Uh, so runtimes actually covers a lot of ground. It is the original JBoss application server known as Enterprise Application Platform, but it is even covers Node.js for our Node.js customers, and it also covers Quarkus. But uh, Karina would be better to answer this because she lived. this is her world, right? This is the world she lives in. Actually, I would say to look for an account manager or someone from Red Hat looking for the Red Hat build of Quarkus. That's the, the, the name of the product. So, <laughs> and then these people will just guide you. What I would add to this question is that uh, this is valid for any technology really. So I think to all this uh, stuff that Burr said that actually builds the ground for Quarkus, you need to leverage the adoption life cycle, uh, the technology adoption life cycle of any new technology. So once they cross that chasm, then you can start thinking it for like long-term so solutions on your company. And I think that's a matter of time, I guess, in analyzing the market. Cool, thank you. I have a question that I came up with in looking up the panelists for the day. Edson, this one's to you. Um, you've just been published in a book called 97 Things Every Java Programmer Should Know on O'Reilly. Congratulations. I just saw that from a couple days ago on your blog. Now, if the book were released as the highly slimmed down Yanaga edition, one thing developers should know, what would that be? Well, I'll have to take the piece that I wrote for this book. Uh, this This book is like... 97 uh, collective art, uh, articles that were uh, written by Java luminaries. Uh, so uh, my piece was behavior is easy, is state is hard. That's some of the things I've been preaching in the past like 15 years. So most of the bugs that you have in your code, if they are caused by behavior, you mean, oh, that line of code is wrong. Huh? That's kind of easy to fix. You have some, if it has a new pointer, you know, the bug is there. But the, by far in my career, the hardest bugs to try to solve in production were the ones caused by inconsistent states. Well, you have a new pointer, but that variable should never be null. You have an area index out of bounds. That string should never be shorter than five characters, but yet it is. Or that number should never be non-positive, but it is minus something. So these are the kinds of inconsistent state and the root cause for that 
is that traditional Java code um, provides too much mutability because we have been taught since version 1.1 about Java beans, everything should be private because we want encapsulation, but we expose all the internal status, getters and setters, so there is no real true encapsulation. And actually, before this webinar, I had a Dev Nation Tech Talk. I was trying to tell people about some techniques of how to reduce mutability in your code so you can avoid these kind of bugs. But I realized that 30 minutes is not enough. And a lot of people are asking me that. So I intend to start a series of videos and blog posts where I try to explain some techniques that I've learned in the past 20 years on how can you achieve a more robust code by trying to avoid the mutability in your Java code base. Nice, thank you. Otavio, we've got time for one more question. Okay. Um... Quarkle is amazing, right? So, and I keep the, the harder question at the end. Okay, there's no silver bullet in the whole software world, right? There is not. When should I not use Quarkle in my Java application? When, when should you not use Quarkus? Well, I'll give you the one that I mentioned earlier. If you have an existing monolithic big old code base and you just want to live in that web sphere, web logic spring JBoss world, you know, I'll, that is, we're not focused on migration. We're focused on starting your next new microservice. So that would be a reasonable example where if my existing team has existing legacy skills for spring slash EJB slash running on web sphere and they're happy with that world, be happy. I'm all about happiness and joy should trump almost everything else. Okay. And I don't mean, I don't mean you, the joy of not working at all. I also believe uh, learning is a critical part of everything that we should be doing in our lives. So get, find joy in learning and moving forward. But at the same time, if you're, you know, if your business is pretty happy with that six month deployment interval on that monolithic WebSphere spring app, you know, stick with it. You know, it's, if that's what meets the business needs, that's how I look at it. Anybody else? When would I not use Quarkus? I think in the past we would say, well, do not use Quarkus for CLI apps, but now you can, and it's awesome. I agree with Burr. I would not, oh, just, that's just my greatest application just because I want to use Quarkus. I would, of course, uh, just try to make a trade off. It's the benefits you would get from adopting Quarkus, uh, overcut like our larger than the cost that you will have with the migration. Okay, if you're going to actively maintain that application for the next 20 years, maybe it's worth a migration or not, but it's always a trade-off. So it needs to be, have a case-by-case -case analysis. And I like to make a point because I've been a Spring developer since Spring 1.0 beta 2. I dedicate my entire career, I owe my career to Java and Spring framework. So I'm a huge fan. I hate when people bash Spring for a lot of reasons because I simply love the stuff. But, uh, and again, it's my opinion, it's completely subjective. Today, if I had to create a new project, if the list of features that Quarkus provides can fit in my application, I would use Quarkus. And there are some use cases where Quarkus doesn't fit and it's perfectly fine. I would be happy doing that in the spring too. So that's my map for deciding which technology to use. And I would say, well, we're starting today, if the Quarkus features uh, can fit in my current application that I want to develop, well, maybe I could enjoy the developer joy of save, refresh, and it's already there. Maybe I could benefit from the very small footprint and very small startup time uh, too. Well, all of these things add on top of my development experience because in the end, we're not really, we shouldn't be really worried about just typing code. We should be worried about delivering that code in produ into production. I believe that if your the list of features is enough for you, Quarkus will make you deliver more code into production in a, in a better and a faster way. That, that's my current point of view. 
That is great. And I love the focus on developer joy. Apropos developer joy, as we're coming up on the top of the hour, let me just remind you that you can, in the body text of this video, try Quarkus on Platform SH, where we contribute to your developer joy by allowing you to create exact copies of entire running applications, including Quarkus with whatever databases or Kafka that you are using for every single Git branch that you create for every single developer on your entire team, instant uh, test environments for everyone. And if you've never tried Platform SH, when you click that link down there, not only do you get Quarkus, but you get a free trial. So go ahead, try it out. Also subscribe to our channel because we do this type of amazing, exciting Deploy Friday every Friday. Uh, now, and we've got lots of great topics coming up. So a warm thank you to the guests. You guys are superstars, awesome. I learned so much. And uh, if I start a new web project, there is a much higher chance now that I would use Quarkus than anything else. Um, although it's unlikely that I'm starting new web projects these days because I'm not the developer, <laughs> you guys are. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, and bye everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Yeah, bye. Okay. We are